focus. Dear. Can't read that. <laughs> There we go. Woo. Okay. All right. So this is um, actually from chapter five, and I'm just pulling out this one particular lesson that I want us to look at, um, and it deals with volume. So any of, uh, don't we have a 3D printer here at school? Yeah, we have a bunch of them. Okay. All right. So um, we're going to talk about volume, and we're going to obtain volume measurements by revolving or rotating a function around the x-axis. Okay, so let's start by, we're going to graph a semicircle that is centered at the origin with radius 3. Okay, so we're going to um, graph the top portion of that semicircle. So if I go up 3 and out 3 and out three, then my semicircle ooh, would look something like that. Okay, imagine that this semicircle is revolved or rotated about the x-axis. What 3D shape is created? So if I take this semicircle, picture that it's a flap of paper attached to this axis and I rotate the axis so that that little semicircle is rotating through space. What shape is formed? Sphere. A sphere. Okay, it would be a solid sphere. Um, so what I would end up with is a three, I don't know how to make a, a sphere look 3D, but anyway, it would be a sphere, not just a 2D circle, but a 3D sphere. One other thing that I have probably seen these party decorations. I think I got these at the dollar store. So if, if I take this semicircle and I rotate it like this, I'm going to have to pull it away from the camera now. That is exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, so it starts with a semicircle. But as it moves through space, revolving around the x-axis, then what I end up with is a sphere. Okay? Cool. So that's what we're trying to imagine. Um, okay, so sphere. How do we find, ooh, put your brain to the test, what's our volume formula for a sphere? Four thirds is right. It's the start. Anybody want to chime in? Pi r volume is in what kind of units? Cube. Four thirds pi r cubed. That is our volume form, just a geometric formula to find the volume of a sphere. Okay, so let's say that we wanted to find the volume of that sphere. It would be four thirds. Pi, what's the radius? Three. Three. Cubed. Okay, let's leave pi in it. So if we're calculating this, don't use pi to multiply. We'll just tack pi in, onto the end of our answer. Um, okay, look at this. If I have three threes, but then I'm going to divide by a three, won't that cancel with one of those? No. Maybe. 
4 thirds pi 3 cubed. Think of it written out that way. Then one of these threes will cancel with that one on the bottom. So I really have 9 times 4 is 36 pi. And if I knew the units, if it was centimeters, then it would be cubic centimeters or cubic feet or whatever the units were. Okay, so we're going to talk about revolving things to come up with 3D shapes. Now, they're not all going to be a semicircle, but that's the easiest one to picture as to what is created. Okay, so this next example, we're going to graph the following functions on the given intervals and sketch the shape created by revolving about the x-axis. Okay, so if I graph y equals 3x, what will that look like? A line. A line crossing through the origin with a slope of 3. But I only want to graph it from 0 to 3. Okay, so 1, 2, okay, 1, 2, 3. I have 0, 0, 1, let's see, I'm going to come down here since I have limited space. If I plug in a 3, then that's 9. And then this would be, it's going to have to form a line there. This would be 6, and that would be 3. And that would be the line y equals 3x from x equals 0 to x equals 3. Is everybody okay how I got that? Okay, so what I want to picture is that I'm just sort of stopping this right here. What is that shape? triangle, right? Okay, so picture that I did the same thing with this little party decoration, but it's a triangle. And I want to rotate it this way about the x-axis. What would be formed? A cone. Okay, so this part is going to come down here. I'm going to end up with a cone. Can you picture that? Okay, now, there won't be an opening in the cone. It'll just be a solid cone. So no ice cream is going in this one. Um, but it would definitely be a cone. Okay, so let's see what this one. Oh, right now we're just trying to picture what would happen. Okay, this one we're going to do the square root of x. What does that look like? Okay, top half of a sideways parabola from 0 to 9. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, the square root of nine is what? Three. So I only need to go up to three. Okay, uh, the square root of one is one. And it's going to look like that. So, let's see if we can kind of make this look 3D. Okay. Question? Okay. Now, for a cone, we would have a geometric formula. Um, One-third... Pi r squared h, I think, is the the formula for a cone. Um, I might actually have to look that up to be sure, but we have a geometric formula. For this, like, tip of a bullet, we don't have a geometric formula for that. So guess what we're going to use to find the volume of it? Calculus. Calculus. Just like we did for that area of shapes we didn't know, we can use it for volume of shapes we don't know. Okay, 1 over x, what does this thing look like? 
it's a hyperbola. Yes, yeah, so you've got the the piece of it in the first quadrant, and then the piece in the third quadrant. We're going from one to five, so we're just dealing with the first quadrant. So I've got like one, two, three, four, five, something like that. So where the other part would go, let me kind of dot up here. It would keep going up like this, and it would keep coming down like that. But I just want this little chunk. Stop there, stop there. Okay, so if I had that little cutout piece taped to an axis and I could actually revolve it, what would you call that shape that was formed? I don't know that it has a name. What would it look like? Yeah, it would kind of like be a, oh, it'd be sort of like a, what are those tall things in chemistry that you measure things in? But aren't, they, but aren't some of them wider at the, at the base? Okay, that's what it makes me think of. So you'd kind of have this coming over here. You'd have this mirror reflection, but like that. Okay, again, it's solid, filled up, but that would be the shape. That's not something we have a geometric formula for, but it is something that calculus could help us find the volume of. Um, okay, e to the x. What's that one look like? Exponential, so exponential growth. Uh, ooh, this one goes from negative one. One, two, three. Okay, so it's going to be super low over here. And get super high pretty quickly. So if I took this shape here, which is a lot like this one over here, and I revolved it, then I would have this mirror image over here. I can like that. So it would kind of be... Ooh, like a funnel that wasn't open in the middle. Okay, so we can rotate all sorts of shapes. Now, is this used? Absolutely, like any type of molding that you do, this is how you figure out the volume. Like, um, my husband used to um, work at a company that made playground equipment. And that's actually what they would do, would they, is they would revolve like melted plastic and make these shapes for playgrounds. Well, before you mold a piece of plastic, you have to know how much plastic you need, right? Well, the volume is how much plastic you need. So by simulating these revolutions, you can find the volume of certain items, which tells you how much material you need for the, the mold to be made, okay? So pretty cool, Lot, lots of things are molded. Y'all have seen, um, 3D printers being used, you have to know how much material to have first, right? Which is volume. So that, on a very small scale, what? Exactly, okay. Okay, so since we don't have geometric volume formulas for the shapes formed above, or on the previous page, imagine that we slice the above shapes into very thin cylinders. Then we could find the volume of the cylinders and add the volumes up. What is the volume of a cylinder formula? And then I'll show you what I mean about the slicing idea. How do we find volume of a cylinder? Remember, I'm going to do a little short squatty cylinder. That's a cylinder. Say that again. Yep, it's area of the base. Well, the base is a circle in a cylinder. So area of a circle is pi r squared, and then times the height. So volume equals pi r squared h, with this being r and this being h. Okay, so let's take... 
let's go back. I'm going to take, I kind of like that last one that we drew. So I went from negative 1 out to 3. I'm just sort of going to redraw this one. Okay, so this was the one that we had. So this function was y equals e to the x. And I went from negative 1 out to positive 3. Now this right here would be, oh, wow, I missed the mark, didn't I? That right there would be the radius at the, if I think of that as like the base that I'm going to stand it up on, that would be the radius of the base. But is that the radius throughout the whole shape? No, like it changes, like here's another radius that's smaller, this one would be the smallest of all the radii, but as you move out to the right, each radius gets a little bit bigger. Okay, so what we're going to do is this slicing concept, which means I'm going to literally slice through and get little bitty cylinders. So imagine like this is a solid piece of plastic that we've revolved and formed. And then I'm literally going to go through and saw it into little slices. And I'm going to say, well, I can approximate the volume here by finding the volume of each of these cylinders and then adding them up. Does that make sense? Okay. Well, how could I get an accurate reading? I can make the cylinders super thin and have a whole bunch of them. Okay, and so that's really what we did with area. Remember when we started talking about rectangles? Well, I'm slicing this, but because it's 3D, they aren't rectangles now. They're cylinders. They're these little discs almost that I'm slicing out. And as I move along, the radius changes. So for right here, the radius would be this measurement. If I come down here and I slice another one, right here, like that, then the radius is here. It's a little bit bigger. So how can I find the radius at each point? The radius will be whatever the y coordinate is right there. If I move down here a little bit, then that y coordinate is the radius. So the y value or the, the width from the axis up to the function, that's the radius of each cylinder. And of course that radius gets bigger until I get all the way down here to the base. Okay, so what I'm going to do is add up, remember that elongated S means add up, a bunch of pi r squareds dx is this distance here, but that's the height of each cylinder. I can't see what I'm doing. That's the height of each cylinder is how far I'm moving on the x-axis. Okay, so really, this represents the height of each cylinder. The y-coordinate on the function is the radius of each cylinder. And then I've got that pi in there because volume is pi r squared h. So do you see how this translates to pi r squared h? H, and I'm going to add up, sum up, a whole bunch of them that are technically almost a height of zero. And that's where the calculus comes in, is it lets us um, make a calculation on the, the height of each of those cylinders being almost zero. Okay, so what is this A to B? A to B is where we started on the x-axis and where we stopped, just like when we found the area of a shape. So it's very similar to finding area, but what we did with area, we didn't have a pi, and we didn't square this. So we had length times width or height times width. Well, now these values are representing um, radius and height of a cylinder. Throw the pi in there, and that gives us the volume. So we've got squared times h, that's giving us three units of measurement. Like say this is in inches, then that becomes inches squared times the inches of the height is where we get that cubic 
inches or feet or miles or whatever it is for our volume measurement. Okay, so short, short good news is we can use calculus to find the exact volume of this that we could also do with geometry or something like this beaker thing or this funnel without an opening, things that we don't have a formula for, we can use calculus to find the exact volume of them. Okay, so that's what we're going to do on the next page. Okay, find the volume of the solid of revolution generated by rotating about the x-axis, the region under the graph. Of, I don't know why that was printed so tiny. Y equals square root of x from 0 to 1. Okay, so the very first thing we're going to do is graph it so we have an idea of what this thing looks like. Okay, so square root of x, I'm just going to say here's one out here, looks like that. Remember, it's a piece of a sideways parabola um, coming from that top half. Okay, so I have that shape there. So if I revolve that, rotating about the x-axis. So that means I am spinning it this way. So I'm taking that x-axis and rotating it, and that shape will come down here, and then I will have that. Okay, so kind of like a bowl that wouldn't stand up, right? Because it has a nice smooth little point um, down here. Kind of like a cracked open acorn or something like that. Okay, so we want to find the volume of that. So that is not something that we have a geometric formula for. So I'm going to set up, I'm going to sum up from 0 to 1 pi r squared h. Okay, well that becomes 0 to 1 pi Okay, the radius at any given point is whatever those y values are. So that's the radius there. That's the radius. That's the radius. That's the radius. So my radius is whatever this value is squared. And then the height is just how much x changes. So that's our dx. So that's pi r squared h. What happens when I square the square root of x? It just gives me x. Now, generally speaking, we leave pi on the answer as pi. So I'm going to bring pi out front like it's a coefficient, because pi is just a number. 0 to 1 of x dx. So pi came out front. I squared the square root of x and just got x. Now that's like as easy as you could get for antiderivative, right? It's just going to be x squared over 2 evaluate from 0 to 1. So now I'm going to still leave pi out front. And I'm going to sub in the 1. So 1 squared over 2 minus sub in 0. And of course, that second fraction is just 0. So I have pi times 1 half minus 0. So I just have, you can do 1 half pi or pi over 2 would be our volume. Because it's a number, like what if I had 3 out in front? You know how we would just still leave 3 with it? So you're doing that. It just has a Greek name to it instead of a normal little number sitting there. Okay, any other questions? Now, if I needed a decimal, then I would take my calculator and just multiply pi times 1 half and get you know, about 1 and a half roughly. Alrighty. Do, on the cappings, does it have a way of calculating volume? Does it tell you what the volume is? If it does, it's by, it's programmed by calculus. But I don't know if it does or not. At some point, it calculates it because it has to know if you have enough material in there, right? 
but it that's how it's programmed. Oh yes, but if you're actually printing an object, oh, yeah. then it's got somewhere in there. It's calculating the volume using calculus um, because your shapes aren't usually just squares, right? It slices it into like different layers, and, actually and those are your cylinders. Mm -hmm. Okay, so find the volume of the solid of revolution generated by rotating about the x-axis the region under the graph of y equals e to the x. From negative 1 to 2. Okay, so exponential curve, but we just have this tiny little piece of it. So we're going to have, when I take this shape here and spin it about the x axis, then I'm getting this reflection down here. into a 3D shape, kind of like a megaphone, a piece of a megaphone anyway. Okay, so again, as I slice these little cylinders throughout, the radius changes, and the radius is dependent on whatever that Y coordinate is on the function. So to find the volume, I will integrate pi r well, r is whatever the y value of that is squared times the height, and I'm going from negative 1 to 2. So here's your pi r squared height. Okay, what happens when I square e to the x? What does that become? e to the 2x because the exponents get multiplied. Okay, so I have, I'm going to go ahead and bring that pi out front. Negative 1 to 2, e to the 2x dx. Okay, there's a little trick that we have to remember when we take the antiderivative of e to the x if there's a number in front. What is that trick? 1 over 2 out in front? Is that what you said? Sure it was. Yes. Okay, so our antiderivative is one half e to the two x from negative one to two. So if it was a three x, we'd have a one third. Four x, one fourth. If it's a one x, then we don't have to worry about it. Okay, so here we go. Pi. 1 half e to the 2 times 2 minus 1 half e to the 2 times negative 1. Okay, so I get pi times, that's 1 half e to the 4. minus one-half e to the negative two. Okay, uh, really there's not much that I could do to, I mean, I could put both of these over two. We could do that. Pi times e to the four minus e to the negative two over two since they're both multiplied by one half. Um, and let's get, just because that's a complicated thing to kind of type in a calculator, let's type it in and also get a decimal for that. If I grab a little ca uh, small yellow calculator, type that in and let's see if we can all get the same decimal for that.
Let's see what we get. Do y'all have it yet? Remember how to get E, second L in? I'm going to multiply pi also. So it should look like, just like it does on the paper. Did you get 85.55? Okay. And this would be cubic units. If I had units, I would be sure to add them, but I don't. So I'll, I'll just put a little reminder that it would be cubic whatever we had. Am I getting something totally different? Yes? Way different. Way different. You want to try it again? Did you remember how to get e to the power? You're good there? Try it again? No. Okay. All right. Yeah, I forgot to tell the um, printer to do double-sided on these. Wasted a few pieces of paper. All right, last example. Find the volume of the solid of revolution generated by rotating the region under the graph of y equals 1 over x from 1 to 3 about the x-axis. Okay, so 1 over x is our hyperbola, so I have a piece of it in the first quadrant and then another piece in the third quadrant, but I'm only going from 1 to 3. So normally it would come down like this over here. Let me draw it in pencil. So it would be like that. But I just want this piece of it here. Okay, so when I revolve it, I'm getting kind of like our um, chemistry lab measure, um, ah, what are they called again? Beaker. Why is it called a beaker? Why not a measuring cup? That's what it is, right? Huh? Yeah, why are they so tall and skinny? And maybe it makes it easier to measure those tiny little measurements because you're not using very much. Actually, that makes total sense. Okay. <laughs> now that I think about it, it would have to be tall and narrow. Okay. Volume is add up a whole bunch of things of pi r squared, but the r's are the y values of the function. So that's pi r squared. H is just that width along the x-axis that we're calling dx, and we're going from 1 to 3. What do I get when I square 1 over x? Square top and bottom, but 1 squared is 1, x squared is x squared. Okay, so I'm going to bring that pi out in front, kind of ignore it for now. 1 to 3 of 1 over x squared dx. Plus, bringing that pi out front, doesn't it just simplify the antiderivative? It's like, okay, I don't need to worry about the pile. Let's just move it out of the way and concentrate on what's left here. Okay, antiderivative of that, what would I do? You did some of these for me on Friday. Come on, you know. Yeah, rewrite it first. So let's make it x to the negative 2 dx. Okay, so now I can do the antiderivative. Pi is still out front. Add 1 to the exponent. It becomes negative 1. Divide by new exponent from 1 to 3. Okay, well, if I divide by negative 1, that just means there's a negative out front. So I could write this as negative x to the negative 1. Okay, well, x to the negative 1 is 1 over x. Negative 1 over x from 1 to 3. Okay, 
see all those little steps there. Okay, now let's sub in our 3. Pi times negative 1 over 3 subtract negative 1 over 1. Well, that minus a negative will become plus. So I have pi times negative 1 third plus 1 over 1. But if I'm getting common denominators, I would use what? 3 over 3. Whew. Pi, negative 1 plus 3, of course, is 2 thirds. 2 thirds. If I needed a decimal, then I would just type that in my calculator. Not too bad. Not very different from finding area. It's just now you have that squared thing going on, which creates that other additional third dimension. Okay. All right. So I have some problems for you to do. On page 500, this is the last assignment from the textbook. Yay! Last one. All right, let's get started. Turn off this video. Now you